Welcome to Bots and Bytes, the ultimate tech talk podcast. Join us as we journey from the realm of AI to the boundless expanse of the cloud. We'll explore the cutting edge technologies that are reshaping customer experiences and driving businesses to new heights. Prepare to be inspired, informed, and intrigued as we delve into the world of innovation and transformation. I'm your host, Jess Vigorito, and this is Bots and Bytes a GTS production where tech dreams become reality. Let's dive in. Welcome tech enthusiasts to Bots and Bytes, the ultimate tech talk podcast. I'm your host, Jess Figueroa from Global Technology Solutions. Today, we're joined by Anat Mystery, Chief CX and AI Officer from GTS. Anat has over 32 years of experience as a highly accomplished IT professional skilled in development, technical leadership, and building agile development groups for cloud innovation aligned with organizational needs. As a senior AI ML evangelist, Anat enables public sector partners on their AI ML journey driving transformative change with cutting edge technology, including generative AI. That all being said, today's deep dive is all about dealing with the challenges of responsible AI with Gen AI. Welcome, Anat. We're so happy to have you join us. Thank you, Jess. Thank you for having me on your podcast. It's my pleasure. Um, Let's just jump right in. Okay. Responsible AI encompasses ethics, transparency, and fairness. Can you explain the key principles and challenges in ensuring AI technologies meet these criteria? Yeah, and it, it's a, that's this opening the Pandora's box there, Jess. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, so, uh, I mean, you know what? It it it's always been there, and then uh, you know you had generative AI come in and Chat GPT. And now all of a sudden, these things have just become like the top most concern of, of everyone that's out there. I mean, you know, when you talk about responsible AI, the first thing they think about is large language models and generative AI. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, it, it does need to fulfill some, some basic requirements. So they want to be able to look for, there's got to be benefit to the, uh, to, to the social nature of, of, in the environment, right? Uh, so communities at large, um, problem scopes of people that are dealing with, with issues, uh, social benefits is, is, a, is a big thing. Fairness, it needs to be able to uh, be unbiased, okay? Uh, you, want, you want to be able to trust the model to be able to give you uh, good answers in a fair manner. So this means like, being able to uh, make sure that it doesn't swing towards one set of individuals, a high income family versus a low income family, uh, uh, mm-hmm. color, race, uh, things like that. Uh, it wasn't actually that long ago, there was uh, this whole thing and, and it still continues to this very day about facial recognition. And you'll notice that a number of the facial recognition partners, the cloud partners, don't even use it anymore and will not use it for things like law enforcement because there was a propensity towards um, certain races and certain demographics, and they would, that would show through. And it just gives you an idea that this has been out there for a long time, of facial recognition. And then you've got privacy, security. Um, you want to be able to make sure that the privacy and security of the individuals are maintained and, and protected, just like anything else in AIML. Uh, everything is based off of uh the body of documents that you use to train the model and you want to be able to make sure that the privacy of the individuals and and whatever data you're using to to train it is protected reliability and safety now reliability and safety comes in the safe use are there enough guardrails in place uh so you know if we go back to generative ai and and large language models there is this uh uh term called three h's so it's, it's about um, being helpful. So we talk about being socially uh, beneficial. Uh, honest is what the answer is coming up is honest or is it making it up, right? Is it doing, you know, hallucinations? And is it harmless? 
And that's an important one, right? Uh, you, you saw experiments that came out earlier, uh, many, many years ago, and basically a model that would suddenly take up some kind of hateful bias or some kind of hateful pose and use it. It, it would actually learn from it and be able to then regurgitate it. So the three H's are very important. Those are the types of guardrails you'd want to incorporate. Then you've got transparency and explainability. Transparency is what did you use to train the model? What is it based off of? You know, you know if, I'm, if I'm creating an application to be able to recognize music and I only train it like 90% on jazz music, right? Then guess what? The 90% of the stuff that's going to predict is going to be jazz, right? So you want to be able to make sure that the model has been trained properly. And then can you explain it? So if a model predicts something, can you say, can the model explain how it got there, right? Another thing that's very important. Then accountability. Any organization that uses uh, large language models, generative AI, have to be accountable for the type of model they put out there because the, the, they are they have the trust of the customers at hand to be able to use it. 100%. I was, I've, I've um, thrown out a lot there to you, Jess. Yeah, you have. I, I wrote down a few <laughs> notes. So I only recently found out about hallucinations and that AI actually could produce them. Can you just quickly share with our audience what that is and how it happens? Yeah, and so it, it comes about from the, the, the term generative, okay, to be able to put answers together in its own words or in the words of things that it's been trained with. The thing about it, though, is that you want to be able to set the bounds of what it is going to be. So at what level does it take uh, poetic license to be able to generate? So, for example, if I asked it a question, and I asked it the first time, it'll come back with an answer. If I ask the very same question the same way, I still want the substance of the answer to, to be correct, but I don't necessarily want it to use the, exactly the same words as I did, as it did the first time I asked, right? Because, so you want to, be able to use the generative AI to, be able to say, hey, write this, but in your own words. The thing is, is that how do you set the bounds? And that's the, that's the problem. There are parameters and all sorts of different levers that you can pull. But at the end of the day, you know, the generative AI, you want it to be able to say, I want you to write it in your own words, but still stay true. And that's where the honesty thing comes into play. Where hallucinations comes in is if you were to ask it something that is just preposterous. And basically, or you provided, you provided it no context. So you say, for example, you say, uh, explain what GTS does. Right. Well, there are so many different GTSs in the world. Right. They could represent GTS or global technology solutions. It could be some other acronym. And so what it's going to do, it's just going to pick something and then go go to town explaining it. And you know, it may be true. It may not be true. It may have been based on data that it, it was trained on. But ultimately, it's trained on the English language or the language of choice or languages of choice so that it knows how to be able to construct sentences and be able to deliver an answer and be able to con be able to provide context as well as uh, uh, the surrounding uh, explanation of what it's what it's trying to write to you. And that's where the hallucinations stem from. Right. OK, thank you for clarifying that. I want to touch in on more on this bias and accountability. Something I often think about is that, you know, different countries are developing different AI, different countries with different cultures, with, with different cultural norms and levels of equality. So you might have one AI that's trained, like, what is a woman's purpose in life? And that AI may kick back to get married and kick out 10 kids versus an AI in our country you know, would probably answer, there's a variety of answers to that question. A woman may choose and, and give us a dozen answers. So that's always very interesting when I think about, because as we move forward into the future, it seems that we're going to end up having AI who are really at opposites with each other <laughs> at, you sure. know, they, yeah. they don't necessarily align and they will not kick out the same answers. So that bias, I think, is a very pressing concern. 
what steps can organizations take to identify, to mitigate bias in their AI systems, and how can that lead to more equitable outcomes? So first of all, you know, as you were explaining, I was I was shaking my head. I was I was actually nodding. So it was that I was agreeing that you know uh, women should get married and pop out ten kids. <laughs> but but I, I I understand the question. I just wanted to call that out from the outset. Um, the the there are mechanisms, um, but you know there isn't something holistic that you can do. You need to be able to have people that are knowledgeable about how the flow works, and you know what what does it take to be able to uh, train up a model? What does it take to 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 build one and to have it function properly? And so there's a, a number of different things in there. Um, in terms of how countries approach it, uh, that's a whole completely different subject that comes into the regulation aspect. Um, but from a bias perspective. It depends on what you train it, right? Whatever you teach it is is what it's going to spit out. So if you have to be able to make sure that the 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 corpus of documents or data that you give it is fair, it's balanced and is representative. Um, the other thing is is that models themselves also have uh, different training values to to show you what their bias is. And it's subjective, right? Um, because bias, it depends on how you use it and how you consume it and what aspects you use, right? So, uh, so you know, there are things called Shapley numbers. There's a, a, an algorithm that's there to, be able to cap calculate Shapley numbers. There's also Owen values as well. And they, they basically form a picture of bias. And effectively, the way they work is these are the what you have going into a model are called features and what you have generated on the outside in general are tokens okay and so what they want to do is be able to say these features influence the token by this amount so you know this percentage of one particular feature affects the output token by five percent or ten percent mm -hmm. and based off of that is how they judge the how much the input is affecting the output and effectively where where that comes into play not so much on the data that you're training it with but how is the model behaving and so basically this shows them the bias within the model and and actually one thing i wanted to add is that you know if you go into the open source arena and look at these uh open source models of, of which there's there's a amazing amount, right? Um, they all ha have a model card that comes with them. And the model card explains what data was it trained on? How big is it? Um, how was it uh, tuned for efficiency? And then um, what, you know, basically how it how it's meant to be behaving. So they, they attempt to do that, but really to order to get a full view of bias, you need to have a more holistic approach because it's such a broad subject. It's, it's quite complicated about all the dependencies that you have that can lead to a final outcome. Yeah, and I've, I don't know that it's been from any reliable source, but I've kind of heard through the grapevine that ChatGPT is more liberal than BARD mm -hmm. in that the answers it provides are... I don't even know necessarily what they mean by liberal. I don't even, I don't think it's a political alignment. I think sure. they're just saying that the, the answers are just more um, less constrained than maybe they are on BART. We both have full, we all have access to them and how they, they're developing in ways that um, at least certain groups of people seem to notice uh, that the answers may be a little different or that they may have some bias built in. Yeah, and, and I think what's interesting about that, Jess, is that um, the the nature, it's, it's hard to quantify in that manner because one of the biggest uh, problems, or not necessarily problems, one of the biggest challenges you have with using, say, so ChatGPT or BARD um, or even any of these you know, other large language models is what they call prompt engineering. So how much context do you even provide it before you ask your question, right? There are, there are 
there's a there's a couple of different terms they they call them zero shot few shot so zero shot basically means i'm just going to ask the question i'm not going to give any examples of of a of a reasonably close question and the correct answer as an example whereas a few shot means if you give a couple examples hey this is a question this is an answer question answer question answer based off of that answer this question that i'm going to ask you right and so there are there are different aspects to that um but in general it it is context sensitive so you know even the models uh, the, there is a, a pattern that they call rag and basically rag is retrieval augmented generation and basically you front end a large language model with this intelligent search engine and it's a it's a very well used pattern and basically what you do is that the the corpus of documents instead of training up the large language model you train up the search engine so then you get a answer back from the search engine of something that's within the document or documents plural and then you use that as your context for actually asking the question to the large language model and so basically it constrains it 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 lessens hallucinations um you're more apt to get i don't know for school questions that it doesn't know the answer to but these are all different patterns that you can use but yeah it 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 is a uh, a constant challenge and it's hard to able to go and put a a, a a a title around something to say it's liberal because it is context sensitive i'm pretty sure that if you put a non liberal context it would come back with a non liberal answer i i've never tested it though yeah that makes sense it'd be interesting to to test to test it out a couple times yeah um let's pivot a little though let's jump into something else you brought up that is a huge concern which is data privacy and security so what best practices should businesses adopt to safeguard their customer data while harnessing the power of ai for improved experiences Yeah. So that's that's a, that's yet another put Pandora's box. It's actually like those <laughs> Russian dolls, you know. Yeah. So <laughs> So yeah, so data privacy and security are important. Um so there is a term called differential privacy. And basically what it means is that um how can I train up my model in such a way that I can ask questions of it and I shouldn't be able to figure out what training data it was actually trained on more aligned to a specific individual or a specific thing okay it's a flourishing field it, there's a lot of research going on um there's many different aspects to it so i i certainly haven't explained it in its entirety sure. you know that's a very hardcore mechanism that you're going to use typically you'll use it in conjunction with something right so for example you may use it as a chatbot interface so basically hey i'm going to talk to a knowledge base of a chatbot and that's going to actually go through a large language model or a generative ai interface but in general what you're wanting to do is to be able to make sure that let's say someone uploads a document you want to be able to make sure that that is managed within the security compliance of what it is you're doing if it's a per, something that contains personal information uh PHI PII data you want to to make sure that you hold that and be able to manage that properly so uh models that that uh constantly talk to something like chat gpt or something that is based as a service that's an open service out there you obviously don't want that because you don't know how that data is used how they're capturing how they're using it right and so you want to be able to use closed models that that are housed within your system that don't have a phone home system where it's reporting stats or anything back to uh, whoever built it right um you want to be able to make sure that the data that you manage from when you capture it to when you actually ask the question is relevant and actually even needs that sort of information so you mar- might mask out PII out of it so for example let's say this is a patient and this is a patient electronic health record well is the name important to figuring out the diagnosis and the ICD-10 codes or anything like that the answer would be no you you don't really need the name right, right? um 
the other things that might be relevant to it, maybe age and things like that, but the name wouldn't be. So you may want to mask that inherently before you even ask the question against the generative AI model. So those are just a few of the things that you would you could do. It just it just means to be a, you have to be responsible for the data that's coming in and how you use it and how you manage it. So I hear what you're saying. I agree wholeheartedly, but it just made me think about how women are frequently diagnosed with anxiety and there's plenty of research and, and well, it's well documented that women can go to the doctor and are less heard than a man is. So mm -hmm. frequently it may take a woman multiple trips to a doctor or a variety of doctors to get an accurate diagnosis. And so one of the tools that I'm thinking in my head, the way we could also use this is if you hide that information, um, obviously if it's face to face, you can't hide the fact, but if you just have a doctor looking over a file, that could be a piece of information that's not, that's not um, included you know, the gender or the sex of the person. And in that way, that also could help to eliminate some bias, even in medical decisions. So I think the, the capabilities, the tools here, as we move forward, I'm always amazed by, by how much it really can help society and how it, it just continues each month. It's like, oh, there's something new that we can do. <laughs> you, you touched on this, um, you know, the document processing so I want to back up a little. I know that GTS offers a wide range of AI services, including intelligent document processes and customer sentiment analysis. So let's delve into these services and discuss how they can address the unique needs of GTS clients and industries. Yeah, and, and it's, it's to solve a general problem, um, but we have uh, numerous different flavors. So um, I'll, I'll, give an, I'll give you an example. Um, a, a, lot of, a lot of organizations will have what we call unstructured data. And the unstructured data basically are documents. They're PDF documents. They could be uh, x-rays. They could be electronic health records. They could be okay. all, sorts, all, all manner of things. And the problem that they have is that either at today, at this very day, or previously when the, the document management system was first built, they were acquiring these documents. And when at the time it was based off of the file name or someone actually typed in the, the value of what they thought that the document should be, it, not necessarily that it's actually that, but they would put it in so that it can be managed through their flows. But at the end of the day, you can end up with a, pot, a, a pool or a swamp of, of data, these unstructured documents. And what intelligent document processing set, tends to do and what it's there to do is to, to do a couple of really good things and very fast and at scale. So first of all, it's able to extract all the text from your documents, images, things like that. It's able to then classify your documents. So what is it? Is it an invoice? Is it a bill? Is it an electronic health record? What is it? And then based off of what it is, you may want to then decide what you want to do with it. I want to extract, you know, it's, a, it's an invoice and I want to extract a total, right? A billing total. Um, but if it's an electronic health record, I'm not going to look for a total, right? So based on what the document is, I, I then maybe okay. extract other information and then I want to enrich the document. So I may want to do redaction. I want to blank out all P PII, PHI from this, and then make this available so that someone else can view it, but I'm not, I don't have to go and violate the PII or PHI protections, HIPAA in general, and, and you know, for any other sort of compliance you might have. And so that's what, that's what the Omnidocs AI essentially brings you, brings you to the table, is that you're able to consume documents, individual documents at scale, and be able to process an output that is now consumable where you've actually added value to your documents and now found out more about what you actually have. Thank you for listening to this episode of Bots and Bytes. To learn more about the topics discussed in this episode, reach out to us at hello at globo-tek.com.